Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Hey everyone, and welcome to our live class. We're so excited to have you here today, and we're looking forward to a great presentation. My name is Anthony, and I'll be your host. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Amy Rolfson, medical consultant at Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. She'll be conducting the presentation today, and I'm going to pass it off to her in just a second to kick off today's topic, which is the H. pylori Masterclass. So this is going to be a great presentation. It's a much needed course, and I'm confident we're going to all learn a ton. Before we begin, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items. Everyone is muted by default. And number two, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host, and I'll be conducting a live question and answer with Dr. Rolfson at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, at the end of today's live class, Adrian Martinez, who is our head of practitioner partnerships at Rupa Health, is going to do a live demonstration for all of you. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, Feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn more about how we can help you optimize your practice. And for those of you who already use us, thanks so much. And if you need to get back to your practice or day, feel free to hop off at that point in time. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Rolfson to begin today's live class. Thank you so much, Anthony. And thank you everyone for being here. It means a lot to me that you're taking the time to learn about H. pylori. So H. pylori is one of my favorite organisms on GI map. It is super elusive, very misunderstood. And I get so many questions about this organism. So really excited to share some things. Now I could probably speak for about six hours on H. pylori and I've got 45 minutes. So I might speak a little bit quickly, um, but I know the most burning question about H. pylori right now is, are we going to get the slides? Are we going to get some notes and absolutely there will be a recording, there will be slides. And so don't worry, just relax and listen. I've got a lot to share with you. So H. pylori is an organism that is really classically hard to treat. There's a big recurrence rate. And so we'll talk about the treatments that are most effective both in the antibiotic world and the natural world. We'll talk a little bit about diet. And so let's get started. If I can move my slides. There we go. So let's first talk about how H. pylori is going to present in your patient. So we all know the classic H. pylori symptoms are upper GI pain, fullness, ulcers, gastric cancer, things like that, that you'll see in the conventional world. But what we see often in the functional world of things is our non-classic GI manifestations. So things like gas and bloatings, gas and bloating, excuse me, histamine type symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, um, you might see nausea and vomiting in pregnancy associated with H. pylori, really bad breath, things like that. And then outside of the GI tract, you're going to see a lot of stuff. And this is our low grade chronic H. pylori. So this is not your acute H. pylori that you would have, you know, treated at the conventional medical doctor, but you may see things like nutrient deficiency. We'll see a lot of unexplained iron deficiency anemia. You may see insomnia, skin stuff. I see a lot of um, hives, so chronic hives, eczema, psoriasis, acne, things like that associated with H. pylori. I've seen a lot of times sinus issues just totally go away after treating H. pylori. So you'll see all the systemic stuff. I'll let you read through this on your own time, but tons of stuff, um, blood sugar regulation, heart stuff, all kinds of things. So moving on pretty quickly from symptoms, what do we know about H. pylori? So we know a lot. There's a huge body of literature out there. I'm going to highlight a few points that I think are really important to know for treating it effectively. So I'm just going to focus on the things that help you treat it. If we treat the nature of H. pylori, the special things about H. pylori, like it's biofilm, you know, coxoid form of H. pylori, you'll get better success. So the basics about this organism, we have been co-evolving with H. pylori for almost 60,000 years. So it's with us. We are with it. It does well with us. Um, and so knowing that eradication might not always be a, a believable option, the best option. And so what I'm going to say today, my main take home point is that some of our H. pylori cases don't need full eradication, but they do need management. So you need to manage the organism, keep it below a symptomatic threshold. And so more than more than 50%, I would say, you know, approaching 50 to 80% of 
people are going to be colonized with H. pylori. So that's a lot of us. It's in almost everybody. A little bit about it. It is a gram negative organism, meaning that we've got two cell walls. So that allows it to be a little bit more resistant to treatment, a little bit sneakier. So it has that periplasmic space where it's able to build up antibiotics, recognize things and pump them back out. So in terms of treating something like H. pylori versus C. diff, a gram positive organism, it's going to be a little bit trickier. Um, it is a helical shaped rod, so not the same as a spirochete. It's a little bit curvy, a little bit rod-like, and it's got up to seven flagellae. And those help it move, help it burrow into the mucosa, which is where it likes to live. The flagellae actually are sheathed, and that is to evade the immune system. So for a lot of things like our protozoa that have flagellae, that is what our immune system recognizes and attacks. But for H. pylori, not the case. You'll see a lot of different genetic variation within H. pylori. It can share its genetic material very readily, very rapidly. And like I said before, very resistant to treatment. I'm sure you've all seen this. If you've tried to treat H. pylori, it doesn't go anywhere easily or quickly. And it does come back in 50 to 80% of cases. So this is an awesome graphic of everywhere on the body H. pylori has been found. So you'll notice up in the eyeball, you'll have some H. pylori, at least in some people. Up here is the key to the colors. So green is culture, blue is PCR, red is histology. Um, what's not pointed out here is the vaginal tract. You'll find some H. pylori there and also attached to red blood cells. Um, what I find really interesting is that you can find H. pylori in your atherosclerotic plaques in the coronary arteries as well. So it's everywhere. It's in almost everybody. It's been there for a really long time. And now I agree with this quote completely. This is from Dr. Martin Blazer. And he is saying that at present, we don't know enough. We're too ignorant about H. pylori to advocate total destruction of this organism. And I would say that's true. There is a lot of evidence that H. pylori can be beneficial, especially in childhood. And for some people, it will be pathogenic. And that really depends on host microbiota, um, the state of the host GI ecology, state of the host immune system, and then the genetic strain of H. pylori that's present. Um, so there's going to be a lot of factors at play there. And what we can do is strengthen the microbiota, strengthen the immunity, bring down the organism, and live in coexistence with H. pylori. So moving on, what H. pylori likes. This is where it likes to hang out. We see in studies a chemotaxis or movement towards proteins, bicarbon cholesterol, so towards a neutral environment, towards cells basically, and away from acid. We find H. pylori in its physiologic habitat in what's called the juxtamucosal mucosa, which is the mucosa right by the epithelial cells. We also see it deep into gastric pits, inside human epithelial cells in some cases, and inside yeast cells. So it's really able to hide away really well. It's a sneaky organism, like I said before, very evasive. And now talking a little bit about H. pylori growth, the things that H. pylori loves, and this is a short list, absolutely. So it loves minerals, nutrients, which it can take from our human cells. It can take from our red blood cells, especially iron. It can feed off of hydrogen. So in your cases of dysbiosis, your SIBO cases, your large intestine dysbiosis cases where you've got hydrogen producing organisms, that gas can actually um, diffuse into the stomach and feed your H. pylori. So it can grow on your hydrogen. And then at the same time, the H. pylori will set the stage by changing the pH of the stomach to promote those hydrogen producing organisms. So it's a feedback loop and it does create the environment that it likes for itself. Um, it can use catecholamines or stress hormones as growth factors. So back in the day when we thought ulcers were from stress, and then we found out they were from H. pylori, they're not, not from stress, but the stress can build the H. pylori populations and cause it to grow. Um, and then biofilm, having biofilm allows H. pylori to grow to higher numbers. Now, what does it produce? A ton of things, and again, a short list. So I'm highlighting the most important things here, the things that allow it to be the most virulent, the things that are targets for treatment. So enzymes, lots of enzymes put out here, including urease. So that's gonna be the enzyme that allows H. pylori to move around in an acidic environment for a short period of time. That's the one that will be neutralizing the stomach acid. Um, LPS, like most gram-negative organisms, H. pylori has LPS on its outer membrane, which in a lot of organisms is inflammatory, but in the case of H. pylori, it's actually a low inflammatory LPS that allows the immune system to have a more tolerogenic 
stance, I guess, um, and allows it to become a persistent infection because it's not being picked up and flagged by the immune system. Um, biofilm, as I mentioned on the slide before, H. pylori does produce biofilm and GGT, actually the enzyme GGT is produced by H. pylori and is one of its major virulence factors. A bunch of other interesting things here, and I guess to point out one more, the outer membrane vesicles are really interesting. So it's constantly budding off these little vesicles. And the theory there is that these are targets for the immune system besides H. pylori, the actual organism. So the immune system may recognize the vesicles. It's like a distraction. So a very sneaky organism, and I'm going to talk about how sneaky it is on the next slide even more. So immune changes with H. pylori. Yes, I know this this is a dense slide, and this is one that you can read on your own time if you are an immunology nerd, um, like I am. But basically what we see here, what changes we see here are an organism that produces low-grade gastritis, so low-grade inflammation, it promotes tolerogenesis of the immune system. So it evades immune detection. It turns down things like macrophages that would come up and gobble it up. Um, and it can affect the normal flora. So persistent infection, low-grade inflammation is the end story on this slide. That's all you really need to take home. But if you want to look deep into that, you will even find more immune reactions in the research. I just shortlisted again here. Now, something that I find shocking and horrifying about H. pylori is that with treatment, it can move from its a spiral rod shape into what's called a coxoid form, which is like a little ball, like a little beach ball. Um, this is a normal morphological variation and it allows H. pylori to withstand stressors. It can stay in this form for up to a year. It's not culturable, it's not producing urease, and it is almost completely antibiotic resistant. So this is driven by the presence of antibiotics, by the presence of botanicals and the presence of proton pump inhibitors. So say you're testing your H. pylori on urea breath test, treating and then retesting with urea breath test, you won't know if that's actually been driven into coxoid form or not. And um, in the research, it's shown that about 85% of H. pylori or up to 85% can move into this coxoid form. So instead of actually being killed by the antibiotics, by the treatment, it's moving into this more you know, non-replicative, low, um, low metabolism form where it just kind of hides out until conditions are more favorable. And then within a year, it can come back out. Um, what is not optimal about this coxoid form, I mean, besides it being totally resistant, is that it can still produce virulence factors and it is associated with the more virulent strains of H. pylori. So this is a problem if you have H. pylori with virulence factors, and I'll talk about what those are later on in the presentation, um, and they've moved into this form, they are very tricky to detect, very challenging to treat, but they're still producing that virulence. And a few solutions that have been put out are more acid inhibition, so making the stomach more neutral, can bring them back out of the coxoid form, make it more hospitable. Uh, linolenic acid, which is one of the superstars of my presentation, I'm going to just spoiler alert right there, and this is flax oil, your other seed oils are high in linolenic acid, so not the same as linoleic acid. Um, and then N-acetylcysteine or other mucolytics. So this is a form, I, I definitely think that in every H. pylori treatment, you should include something to resist this coxoid form, to make the environment more hospitable, to freak the H. pylori out a little bit less. Um, now moving on, I'll just spend a moment on this slide, but common co-infections of H. pylori, you'll see a lot of uh, co-infections in the gut when H. pylori is present. It can make the environment very favorable for growth. We see a lot of yeast with H. pylori. H. pylori can actually exist within the vacuoles of yeast um, and can hide out there because yeast can withstand really severe pH conditions, whereas H. pylori can't. It prefers about 6 to 8 pH. Now, E. coli, we see a lot of our pathogenic E. coli, a lot of Escherichia genus when H. pylori is present. Other um, acid-resistant organisms do really well in the presence of H. pylori. You'll see a lot of hydrogen producing bacteria and then a lot of protozoa and other parasites. So let's talk a little bit about H. pylori. Is it our friend or is it our enemy? Um, I'm going to say it is both. And like I said before, it depends on your body. It depends on your patient's body. I mean, if you're, if you're the patient, it depends on your body and it depends on the strain of H. pylori that you've got. So we do know that H. pylori can be a pathogen. It can be a severe pathogen for some people. It can evade, invade tissue and disrupt cell membranes. 
It causes gastritis. It can lead to ulcers and cancer. It is actually classified as a group one carcinogen. So not just gastric carcinoma, but colorectal cancer, cancer, esophageal, pharyngeal cancer, and malt lymphoma. But then it can also be beneficial commensal. So when I talked before about the immune system and how each pylori can promote tolerogenesis, this can be really beneficial in our kids with allergies. It can be protective against asthma and allergies, maybe protective against IBD. Um, and you'll see most of the benefits during childhood and maybe celiac disease. It's, it's not totally clear whether it protects against IBD or celiac disease, but there is a correlation. And again, it's in most people. So it must be a little bit commensal because most people are doing okay. Many people are doing poorly with H. pylori, but most people are doing just fine or having low grade symptoms and we can work with that. Um, so again, I'm gonna say total eradication is not always gonna be the goal. So let's look at GI map. So GI map is a quantitative PCR test that is looking for DNA. Um, and here in this great paper by Testament and Morris, I quoted this paper a lot, but with PCR, you can get sensitivity nearing 100% and specific specificity at 100%, which is amazing. Um, we can actually pick up the coxoid form of H. pylori. It just would probably show up as a lower number than it otherwise would. Um, so quantitative PCR is basically different from normal PCR in that instead of a positive negative, you'll get the exact number of organisms per gram of stool. So that will weigh in clinically, and I'll show you some kind of micro cases later where you'll look at the number of H. pylori and decide, okay, there's a tiny bit, let's leave it. There's a lot, let's treat it. Somewhere in between, it depends on symptoms. Um, now we've got the reference range on the GI map set at the 95th percentile. So we've got a statistically significant reference range, which means a different thing than clinical significance. So within this range, and I'll move to the next slide here, you'll see that H. pylori here is out of the statistically significant range. But if it were less than this number, it still could be clinically significant. And we see a lot of clinically significant cases within that range. So this number is up for your clinical interpretation, which is challenging for you, obviously. Um, we're here to help with the clinical team. And if you call in, we'll help you out with that. But generally when it's out of range, it is worthy of some form of treatment or management. So here at the top of the, of the test here, we see Helicobacter pylori on the left. In the middle, we've got our result. So 1.3 E3 is the same as 1.3 times 10 to the power of three. So that's an exponent. So this is at 1300. The range is set at a thousand, so we're out of range. Um, below this, we've got our eight virulence factors, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but they're genes basically on H. pylori that can be present in the H. pylori genome that cause different nasty things. Um, and that's all I want to say on this slide, because I'm going to talk about virulence factors next. So here's another test. So here's an H. pylori that is within that statistically significant range, but it's really approaching the top. So here, if you read that, 8E2 is the same as 800. The range goes to 1,000. If someone were symptomatic enough, I would consider treating at this level. Now, the virulence factors, I had a whole bunch of slides on these, and I had to cut them, but I will be doing another presentation on just the virulence factors in the future um, if you want to dig deep into those. And I've also included a little mini guide on how treatment may differ based on the different virulence factors. Um, but the ones present here, CAG-A and OIPA are associated with gastric cancer. Virulence factors B and D are associated with the CAG-A, this one up here. They're on what's called a pathogenicity island or a group of genes, and they can help potentiate the CAG-A virulence factors. So basically, we've got genes here that code for things like inflammation, adhesion, um, duodenal ulcers in this case, a lot that code for gastric cancer and gastric ulcers. And then this one here, um, VAC-A causes um, programmed cell death, um, tight junction mis uh, malfunction, same with CAG-A with the, with the tight junction issues and barrier function issues. Um, but this one can really steal out of a lot of nutrients from us. And I would say the CAG A and the VAC A are the most uh, characterized in the research. You'll find a lot of information on those. The rest, a little bit less, but um, a lot to know about these. And we can help you when you call in. So the next slide here, I'm not going to go in detail, but just for your reference, if you come up with these virulence factors, 
these are just my little notes on what you may want to do. But generally, when you have a virulence factor showing up, treat until that H. pylori is no longer present, no longer detectable. Whereas if you have an H. pylori without virulence factors, I usually treat it until it's, I don't know, 300 organisms per gram and asymptomatic. So um, these you take a bit more seriously because they are nasty. So talking a bit about antibiotic resistance, what we offer on GI map is the ability to see which antibiotics the strain of H. pylori is resistant to, which is pretty amazing. And treatment should be personalized based on this susceptibility. Um, so here's what the antibiotic resistance section looks like. Here you'll see the gene. So GYRA and 87K is a single gene um, and here it's present and you see positive next to fluoroquinolone. So in this case, and in most cases, you wouldn't use a fluoroquinolone. I would say fluor fluoroquinolones are one of the medications that I would have to be under severe pressure to prescribe. I think it'd be a, a life or death kind of thing. I don't, don't prescribe those, but in this case, if you wanted to prescribe a fluoroquinolone, I would not do so given that there is resistant genes present. Um, here's what it looks like with one gene um, against clarithromycin. So you wouldn't use clarithromycin in this case. And it's just that simple. If there's red, don't use that antibiotic. Okay. Now a couple of tiny little cases on H. pylori. So I get a lot of people calling and saying, okay, tell me what to do. And I say, you know, I don't know. I, it depends. Sometimes you can treat it. Sometimes you treat it or you treat other things and then you come back for H. pylori if you need to. So when it's out of range, I treat. When it's got virulence factors, I treat. Um, when someone is deeply symptomatic and it's showing up, I treat. Um, autoimmunity would, not every case of autoimmunity would I treat, but it would lend a little bit more significance if a family member were being treated for H. pylori, things like that, or a, a recent history of H. pylori treatment, and you're seeing it on the test, even at a mid-level, I'd say, yeah, it probably was not a successful treatment. Um, so looking at this one, this one is out of range, and we've got here a 49-year-old female with chronic low ferritin, abdominal pain, and difficulty gaining weight. So that, you know, that nutrient deficiency picture, that difficulty gaining weight despite eating a lot, I think there was a low appetite in this case, abdominal pain and low ferritin, those are all H. pylori signs and symptoms. It's out of range, those virulence factors, I would treat this. And how I would treat that, that would be up for interpretation. It would, you know, it would be my goals, my patient's goals and things like that. But I do often use antibiotics when I've got the virulence factors present, but you don't have to. Um, so next slide here, we've got a negative H. pylori test. So this was a patient who was a 54 year old male, negative H. pylori and biopsy, but severe gas and bloating, daily reflux and insomnia, lots of H. pylori symptoms there. H. pylori is not present. And again, I get a lot of people that ask me, should I treat for H. pylori anyway, even though it's not showing up? And I say, no. I don't think so. Look through the rest of the test, see if there's other organisms that might be causing those symptoms. So things like candida, pseudomonas, any histamine producers can produce a lot of H. pylori-esque symptoms. There, there's a lot of overlap between um, our histamine symptoms and our H. pylori symptoms. Same with our SIBO type symptoms, our upper GI dysbiosis symptoms and H. pylori. So I would treat the lower hanging fruit. And then on retest, you might see more H. pylori. It is not uncommon to see more H. pylori on retest than you saw on the first because it's a sneaky organism that likes to hide. Um, but I wouldn't treat it based on a negative test. Um, so here, we're way out of range. We're at the E4 level here. And this was a 28-year-old female who'd been trying to conceive for four years, had multiple rounds of failed assisted reproductive technology. Um, she was having a lot of hair loss, super high stress, anxiety, gas, and bloating. And she also had Giardia. Um, and so it can be challenging to work with your... Um, with your trying to conceive patients or your fertility patients because they're often on a time frame. So I may be more likely to use antibiotics because it's quick um, with somebody who's trying to conceive, but I would treat in this case, absolutely. And this, and especially combined with Giardia, could definitely affect someone's ability to get pregnant. So there is research in H. pylori and infertility as well. Um, here we've got the same test again. We saw this one at 800 with four virulence factors. This was a 44-year-old female with Hashimoto's and low white blood cells. Um, Hashimoto's is highly associated with H. pylori. And I would treat, there are virulence factors here and she's close to the edge of the range. Not a lot of GI symptoms, but I would treat this in some capacity. 
Now, this was a 38-year-old female, gas and bloating worse after meals, indigestion. Um, she was showing low digestive enzymes and some bacterial overgrowth. And in this case, I would treat the bacterial overgrowth first. And if I needed to, I'd come back for the H. pylori. This number is not compelling to me, 180 organisms per gram, not really high enough, not really compelling enough symptoms. So I would leave this and I'd come back. And I promise you, if you don't treat H. pylori, it is probably not going anywhere. It is one of those organisms that just sticks around. So feel confident that this 38 year old female probably has had H. pylori for 20 plus years. Nothing has changed now that you know it's present. Just wait, see if you need to treat it. And that's okay. But in this case, so 320 organisms per gram, this was a 62 year old male. He was on Dexalent 30 milligrams a day for three years. He had Barrett's esophagus, reflux, history of ulcerations with scarring, um, a little bit of a hiatal hernia, which isn't really uh, related to H. pylori, but he's got really compelling symptoms. So I would consider treating this. Um, and I probably would treat that. And I'd also look for other organisms that might be contributing to upper GI inflammation and dysbiosis, but I would probably treat that H. pylori even at a low level. So managing your cases, like I've said over and over again, complete eradication is not needed to prevent disease. It's not always going to be your goal, although it can be your goal. Um, and in the case of virulence factors, it should be the goal, in my opinion. Um, so you can change the amount of organism, you can boost the immunity, you can boost the microbiota of the host and a lot of things we can do there. So first figure out what your goals are for treatment. We obviously want symptom relief. We want our patients to feel better, but do you want to eradicate or do you want to decimate, which means just bring it down by 10%, 20%, 30%. So what are your markers? Uh, and then select your biomarkers for success. Do you want to see hair loss slowing down? Do you want to see hair growing back? Do you want to see someone's abdominal pain going away? Things like that. So pick the symptoms that you want to see getting better and make them kind of H. pylori specific symptoms. If it's something like diarrhea and you've also got, you know, E. coli on board, the diarrhea going away is not going to be necessarily associated with the H. pylori going away. And then retest, adjust your protocol as needed. And I'll talk in two slides about retesting. Um, so here are my personal guidelines about what I always include in my H. pylori protocols. And this looks super daunting. I've got some slides later on that I'm not going to go through with you, but I'm going to click through them. Things like urease inhibitors in the natural world, biofilm disruptors, things like that. So these are all the actions you want. You can have botanicals and supplements that hit two or three or four of these categories, and that's fine. So you double and triple up with, with agents, but make sure you're hitting all of these areas. So you want to be using an antimicrobial, both intra and extracellular, you want to be protecting the gut lining. You want to be correcting any inflammation, mitochondrial support. I'm not going to go through all of these, but refer back to this when you're making your protocols and then look at the other slides and see if you've got a little bit of everything. And then when it comes to retesting, so your protocols with antibiotics are generally two weeks long. Natural, the most common protocol would be two months long, sometimes two and a half or three if you're including, you know, other generalized dysbiosis treatment. And after treatment, you wait four weeks and some people go up to six to eight weeks and retest. I think four weeks is really reasonable. And a positive retest is really common. Seeing more than the original test on retest is also common. Um, so decide what success looks like to you. Is it just symptom, or a symptom elimination or do you want to see the number going down? I would say you'd want to see the number at least going down within range and symptoms getting better or gone. So the options with GI map, you can run the full GI map, you can run an H. pylori panel just by itself, which also gives you the resistance genes, or the pathogen panel gives you page one and H. pylori. So those cases where you come up with Giardia and H. pylori and you want to retest both, or E. coli and H. pylori, et cetera. Um, that's when you choose just the pathogen panel. And a lot of people retest the whole thing. So let's dive into treatment. I'm keeping an eye on time. Oh, man. I'm going to go fast through these. So antibiotics, I'm not going to talk about in as much depth as the natural, because I think everybody wants to focus on the natural stuff because it's really interesting. But if you're going to use antibiotics, that's totally fine. They're great. They can be really effective, but make sure you're doing it for a compelling reason and make sure the protocols you're using are effective. So I've given success rates in here, and I'm basing that on the intention to treat. And so there's two, two um, kind of 
lines of data you'll see in papers, and that's going to be intention to treat, which is real world scenarios. So doctor gives 75 patients an antibiotic, here's what happened versus per protocol, which is if somebody follows the directions to a T. So our patients and my patients follow the intention to treat because some of them forget pills, things like that. So intention to treat is obviously going to be a little lower than the per protocol numbers. And here we're seeing some of the common antibiotics used um, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, metronidazole are some of the three most common, I would say, is building up to these two in particular, and fluoroquinolones, I have never used in practice and probably wouldn't if I could get away with it. Um, they are still considered one of the first line treatments, and you'll see later they are not very effective at this point and also have some really serious risk um, you know, risk in our population and the resistance is a risk as well. So some people are using nitazoxanide, a lot of people are using the cyclins, um, and very uncommonly the rifabutin also has some safety concerns. Um, so triple therapy is the most commonly used in, in practice. Um, you'll see the classic triple therapy at about 75% success. So here's some other options here, but you can kind of power up your triple therapies um, and it seems like the more acid inhibition you have, this is going to be your proton pump inhibitors, the more acid inhibition, the more effective the cure rate. So over and over again, you'll see more acid inhibition, longer protocols lead to a better cure rate. Um, so they're going to increase the growth of your H. pylori uh, by raising the pH and making the H. pylori more metabolic, more sensitive to antibiotic therapies. And they'll also see greater concentration of antibiotics in the mucosa. And so the antibiotics are actually getting to where the, the H. pylori lives. So very effective. And then you'll see some of your antibiotics are more effective at a higher pH, especially clarithromycin, which is active at about 7.4. So kind of the, the benchmark for the PPIs is to get your pH steady over four, which is still pretty low when you're looking at an antibiotic that's active at 7.4 and actually at two, clarithromycin has a half-life of about an hour to 1.3 hours. So really not working that well unless you have really good acid inhibition. Amoxicillin is in there too. Metronidazole, not acid sensitive. And tetracycline, which is often in quadruple therapy, is um, supposed to be a little bit more active at lower pH, but you'll see in quadruple therapy, your efficacy is actually higher with more acid inhibition. And that's probably because it gets into the mucosa more. The mucosa is less viscous at higher pH. So things are able to penetrate a bit more and the H. pylori is a little bit happier, a little bit more active. So ingesting more antibiotics. Um, now looking at proton pump inhibitors, I'll let you look at this yourself, but they're not all created equal. It seems like isomeprazole is the most effective. And then there's this kind of wonder drug in the world of, um, in the world of acid suppression, venoprazen, which can keep your acid high, nope, your pH high, your acid low for over 24 hours. It's not yet approved in North America. So I'm going to shed that one and we can dream about it, but it seems to increase our efficacy rates by about 10%. Now, bismuth has some real world action against H. pylori. It is antimicrobial. It can incorporate into the cell membrane of H. pylori and it increases, it, it could increase your efficacy up to 30 to 40% with really resistant infections. And kind of the conclusion of the papers I was looking at was that it's reasonable to add bismuth to triple therapy. It's reasonable to add it to any first line therapy. And I'll let you read the rest yourself. So bismuth quad, another first line choice. And this is a really good success rate. Um, we'll talk next about non-bismuth quad, but here's some modified bismuth quad, this one with this pre-made product Pylera with amoxicillin, so actually quintuple therapy, super effective. Um, now non-bismuth quad is going to be a combination of amoxicillin, clarithromycin, metronidazole, and proton pump inhibitors in different combinations. And the winner here over and over is the reverse hybrid. Um, which is all four for seven days. And then the next set of seven days, so the second week, just amoxicillin and a proton pump inhibitor. And that's got great, pretty, pretty great success, but a decent amount of side effects. Um, another option, and we're almost getting to the end of the antibiotics, would be your high dose dual therapies. And this has been promoted as one of our really good um, options against coxoid form of H. pylori. So get in, treat it really fast, hot and heavy, and it won't have time to move into that coxoid form with a lot of acid inhibition. So that's amoxicillin, high-dose amoxicillin with a high-dose PPI.
and less antibiotics used, really low side effect profile for an H. pylori protocol. Um, a lot of them are, you know, 30 to 50% success, or not success, um, side effect rates. Um, now, Alinea nitazoxanide has some action. It's got a place in H. pylori therapy, um, but there may be some issues with resistance. So there are some protocols you can find using Alinea. So if you had, say, a helminth and you wanted to treat the worm and H. pylori, you might want to incorporate nitazoxanide into your therapies. Um, Rifaximin has some research, not very effective for H. pylori in vivo, but in vitro, it's great. So in summary for the antibiotics, we want to go for at least 90% eradication. Um, the most common things people are doing in, in practice are going to be the classic triple therapy. A lot of people are using classic triple therapy, even though it's not very effective. And concomitant, so that's one of the non-bismuth quad therapies where you just use all four of those, or three antibiotics and a PPI, straight for two weeks. Um, less effective, though. And the highest eradication you'll find with the venoprazen triple, which is triple therapy, but instead of PPI, you've got venoprazen and reverse hybrid non-bismuth quad, the one I pointed out. Um, from what I can tell, the other really promising regimens would be the Pylera, so the pre-made quad therapy, plus PPI, plus amoxicillin, so your quintuple therapy, and then high-dose high dose dual therapy. Um, and then again, more acid suppression, longer treatment leads to better results. Now here I've got a slide that you're gonna just have to read on your own because I don't have time for it. And these are the things that have great research when added to antibiotic protocols. So really important here for layering your treatment modalities. You can use antibiotics and natural treatments, and these are the ones that have really good research behind them. You could also add these to your natural treatment protocols if you want to power them up a bit, add some black cumin seed or some cranberry juice or some one-way shoe. Um, really fantastic results with these. And probiotics. So let's get on to the natural things, because I have a feeling most of you want to know about the natural stuff and what actually works, what's been shown in the literature to have effects in vivo. So we have a huge number of herbs that are effective in vitro, and that's fantastic. But what we know is that in vitro and in vivo are totally not the same thing. You get totally different dynamics. Only about 50% of H. pylori genes are turned on in vitro. So that's going to be really different. And if you have an organism hiding beneath the mucosa, maybe inside cells, maybe inside yeast cells, you want to see what works in the real world. So I've pointed out just a few botanicals, and then I've got some slides with herbs that have great in vitro research that you can toss in if, if you want to. We don't know how they react in vivo, but they're worth trying if you feel safe about them. And, and a lot of them are super safe. Um, so masticum, we're using a lot of masticum in practice. It's been used for 2,500 years for classic H. pylori symptoms before we knew H. pylori was a thing. So, you know, you could use this in anybody with upper GI inflammation and pain. It's super safe up to two grams per kilogram of body weight. And then in vivo, I'll skip the in vitro stuff. Actually, no, in vitro, it has anti-biofilm activity, which is pretty great and strong anti-H pylori activity. But in vivo, it relieves stomach pain in 80% of people, relieved ulcers and gastric tissue damage in 70%, and that is on microscopy. And then about a 50% eradication rate as monotherapy. Um, it's less effective when you use a proton pump inhibitor and actually has been shown to be a little bit more effective with a bit of acid. So it goes against the antibiotic um, protocols where you're, it's more effective with a PPI. Um, now, if you look back at the 80s, when they were testing things like clarithromycin as monotherapy, back when clarithromycin actually worked, it was getting about 54% eradication rate. So seeing 50% as a monotherapy for something natural, that's not bad. And I mean, that's, that's half your patients could use just masticum. And most people are combining it with other things, combining it with sulforaphane and, you know, other wonderful wonderful things. But what I think we should be con combining it with is black cumin seed. So this is a traditional use remedy, and it's got a lot of in vivo research. It's got all these actions at the top. You can read those yourself. But just two grams daily divided with a proton pump inhibitor had a 66.7% eradication rate, which is amazing for a natural agent. Um, six grams daily with honey divided for two weeks, 57% eradication. And then 
you know, different doses here, five grams, two grams, but anywhere, anywhere between two and six grams daily seems like the, the hot dose to use for black cumin seed. Now I forgot to bring my little bag in here, but you can find black cumin seed in the spice aisle. If you live in a town or a city with a good South Asian population, you'll have a wonderful spice aisle and it is sold as Kalonji, K-A-L-O-N-J-I. And I bought 200 grams for less than $4 and those are Canadian dollars. So like less than 10 cents US or something, $3 maybe. Um, and again, super safe. So this is rabbits. I know we're not rabbits, we're humans, but it's safe up to 28 grams per kilogram in rabbits. So compared with masticum, which was super safe at two grams per kilogram, yeah, two grams per kilogram, 28 grams per kilogram, that is so much black human seed that you could take safely. So this is one that I feel really strongly about in our protocols. Now licorice, we see a lot of use of DGL. Obviously we need to be careful with hypertension when you're using street licorice, but in vivo, it can be swapped out for bismuth when you add it to quad therapy. So if you have someone that you have concerns with bismuth, maybe heavy metal concerns or something like that, um, you can add that in, you can do both. Um, it's also got anti-H pylori activity in vitro, but not so much showing up in vivo for it. And we use this as an adhesion inhibitor as well. I use it um, as an efflux pump inhibitor for antibiotic resistance. So I do usually add licorice to my antibiotic protocols. Now, cranberry, I love this one for children, for pregnant ladies. So this is category A in pregnancy. It has not been shown to be um, anti-H pylori or, or cause eradication in vivo, but it suppresses in vivo. So it decreases our levels, um, doesn't bring them all the way down, but it can bring symptoms down and it can block urease. So H. pylori's ability to survive an acid and it can um, inhibit adhesion, which is when H. pylori sticks to your cells. So this can be a really reasonable approach for children without symptoms that have H. pylori or are pregnant ladies that are really struggling, but you don't want to give them antibiotics. Cranberry is super safe. Cranberry juice is what they're studying. Um, now, same with ginger, category A in pregnancy. Um, and then in vitro, it is inhibitory, not um, cytotoxic against H. pylori, and it can act as a natural potassium channel acid blocker, and that's what venalprazan is, basically. Um, so it can uh, modulate our pH of our stomach. So an additive to therapy, not a, not a standalone monotherapy. Now, curcumin is a superstar for H. pylori, so it's not got in vivo human H anti-H. pylori activity, but in mice it does, which isn't the same thing, but you can decrease ulcers in people. There's the dosing on the bottom in the study. 76% um, of people with ulcers, they went away by 12 weeks and symptoms went away between one and two weeks. Um, now here we're talking about our isothiocyanates, our kind of broccoli compounds and sulforaphane. So in a study of men, I believe in China, they were correlating isothiocyanate urine levels with gastric cancer and found that the highest levels of urine isothiocyanates had the lowest risk of gastric cancer. So that's compelling. Um, in vivo, sulforaphane decreases your H. pylori, helps with inflammation. This is the agent that I would use if you have a patient who's chronically on NSAIDs or on indomethacin and you're worried about gastritis. Sulforaphane is the thing to use and it decreases your nitric oxide levels that's put out by H. pylori and that causes the gastritis. So an add-on for inflammation is what I would use sulforaphane for. Resveratrol and red wine. Um, I've got a slide later on my top choices for long-term management and, and resveratrol and red wine are on there, but it inhibits H. pylori and inhibits urease. But it's got so much great research. In, vi in vitro, it is really strong. Even just like dumping red wine in a dish with H. pylori makes it go away. Um, now in diet, I'm gonna talk about how I, I don't want to give everyone a free license here, but alcohol does not, moderate alcohol does not seem to be a risk factor in H. pylori. Neither do smoking, neither does coffee. Um, and it seems like the more red wine you drink, the more antimicrobial it is against H. pylori, but don't tell your patients that. Um, but moderate red wine consumption can be really reasonable in managing your kind of chronic low-grade infections that you want to keep down. Now, green tea, one of my favorites, it hits all those categories, you know, anti-adhesion, biofilm disruption, um, it's really great for antibiotic resistance and it is bactericidal in vitro and in vivo. So green tea daily, why not? Now here are those slides I promised you in vitro research on these botanicals and these essential oils. I'm going to leave it at that. Here's your urease inhibitors, your biofilm disruptors, adhesion inhibitors, quorum sensing inhibitors. The end. And now let's talk about diet because I've got 
looks like three minutes left or so, but I might take five if that's okay, Anthony. Um, cause diet is just so interesting. And I do think that diet is a reasonable approach for our patients that have low grade symptoms that you just want to manage those levels instead of actually killing. So, um, diet can control the growth and virulence and expression of H. pylori. It can make you healthier. It can help your immune system. Um, so it can be bactericidal. It can block adhesion. It can be antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, all those wonderful things. And it is powerful. What you put in your body changes your body and affects your microbiota. Um, so what to avoid salt, high nickel diet, um, smoked pickled, salted foods and nitrates, but then coffee smoking and moderate alcohol, like I said, don't appear to be risk factors. So a short list of things to avoid there and then things to eat, um, in the fruit world, berries are the powerhouse. So all the berries, even strawberry, raspberry, um, have in vitro anti-H pylori activity. We've got cranberry juice. Um, blueberry juice has also been studied and pomegranate juice. I think blueberry and pomegranate are a little bit high in sugar for most people to do chronically, but cranberry juice, fantastic. And then apples and grapes, again, the sulforaphane with grapes, I would probably aim for the red, kind of red, purple grapes over the green ones, but grapes in general have been studied. And then in veggies, it's again, the sulforaphane compounds, the broccoli sprouts, cabbage, radish, things like sauerkraut, because fermented foods are fantastic. Um, red bell peppers, garlic, and then sea veggies. Oils are amazing. And in some studies, linolenic acid, again, those flax and seed oils, in vitro, they are strongly bactericidal against H. pylori. And it was within like one to five minutes when you add linolenic acid, H. pylori goes from a spiral rod to like a plumped up, like hot dog shaped rod and cannot move. So it really affects H. pylori's ability to exist. Um, if you can get it on site to where H. pylori lives. So linolenic acid, I mean, dosing flax oil daily would be really reasonable. Fish oil, similar activity, and a lot of the oils had activity, but linolenic was the strongest. Um, and monolaurin as well, if you're using that for other therapies, you can double dip and use it for H. pylori. It's great. When it comes to dairy, lactoferrin was the superstar. It's on that page of things you can add to your antibiotic therapies. It binds up the iron and makes it less available for H. pylori, and H. pylori relies on iron for growth. Colostrum, great for the immune system. And then herbs and spices use these liberally. There's black cumin seed again, of course. Probiotics have a ton of research and I didn't have time to give them their own slide, um, but I will in the future. And then these wonderful nutrients, zinc carnosine is a nice powerhouse for healing up the mucosa. And now in the other section, we've got a red wine resveratrol. We've touched on that, but it seems as if weekly honey consumption. So one serving a week of honey is um, associated with lower prevalence of H. pylori infection. So just a little bit of honey can be really effective. It doesn't have to be Manuka or any powerhouse honey, but it can be. Um, but a little bit of honey in the diet is great. Um, and then to wrap it all up, I've got a little summary here. So choose your treatment. So I generally keep antibiotics for my serious acute cases. Botanical antimicrobials, so intention to kill with herbs, are going to be my low-grade, you know, maybe just out of range, but low symptomatic H. pylori cases. So not people with ulcers or upper GI cramping and pain. And then long-term management, and that's gonna be you know diet, lifestyle, working on the microbiome, that's gonna be our asymptomatic or our mildly symptomatic cases, but H. pylori is still showing up mid-range in pregnancy and young children. I'd, I'd rather not treat in young children if I, if I can get away with it. And then to maintain remission. So after your antibiotic treatment, and during your antibiotic treatment, you swap over to the diet lifestyle and balancing protocols. So you can layer your treatment, like that one slide where I talk about uh, botanicals and things to add to your antibiotics, absolutely do it all. And then retest and adjust your protocol as needed. Of course, choosing what success means to you. So in terms of long-term management, these are my top choices for long-term you know, drinking green tea, drinking a little bit of red wine if you want to, eating lots of berries, cruciferous veg, fermented foods, things like that, cranberry or blueberry juice. Um, I think these things are really reasonable, things that your patients can do every day and not feel like they're doing something medically necessary and horrible. So, um, you know, if you're going to do something for the rest of your life, make sure it is enjoyable and manageable. And I do think all the things on this list are super reasonable. So that's all I want to say today. I know it was a bit of a whirlwind but we got through it and I am ready for questions. So um, before questions, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to me. And I know I speak quickly. Um, enjoy it. You can slow me down on YouTube later.
Dr. Rolfson, that was amazing. I want to give you a virtual big round of applause. Thank you so much. Seriously, great presentation. H. pylori, this is such an amazing, interesting, and tough bug. And as you discussed, has a pretty high recurrence rate in patients. So I think it's really important to understand this topic. And you really did a, a fantastic job of breaking down clinical presentation, laboratory interpretation, including the virulence factors, and also a lot of different treatment options for our practitioners practitioners to use in their practice. So again, amazing job. Thank you for that. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, so at this point in time, I'd like to jump into the question and answer. We do have some questions for you. So if you're ready, I'm going to dive into number one. I'm always ready. All right. Amazing. So question number one is, could you give an example of how you would build a natural H. pylori protocol, kind of going off of the, the examples that you kind of just went on? Totally. Yeah. So if I had a patient and I was planning to kill their H. pylori, so somebody is, you know, at 1400 organisms per gram, they have no virulence factors. I'm not going to use antibiotics. I would definitely lean into mastic gum and black human seed. So I would probably do, um, you know, up to three grams, no, around three grams of mastic gum daily is what I would do divided either in a combo formula. And I won't mention any names of combo formulas, but there's some good ones out there. Sometimes you want to bump up the level of mastic there to get a good effect. And then I would do black cumin seed. And so they can buy that in capsule form, but you can also go to the grocery store and get it, grind it yourself and mix it with honey. There's nothing wrong with that. So the mastic you want to dose away from food, the honey, the, the uh, black cumin honey you want to take just after meals. Um, I would not be doing any acid suppression, nor would I be using HCL if I'm using mastic gum. So I wouldn't incorporate anything there, but generally people with H. pylori need some help with digestion. So I would give some digestive help. I would give a probiotic. I would probably give, um, you know, I'd give a lacto, lactobacillus reuteri and probably saccharomyces boulardii. Those are my two faves for H. pylori, but there's a lot of research on a lot of different strains, especially of the lactobacilli. Um, and then I'd be including, I'd probably go for diet for most of our other things. I would give some vitamin C, um, vitamin E in vivo. There's kind of mixed results of vitamin C and E, but I like them for other things like, you know, collagen production, immune support. I'd be boosting the immune system. So I usually use an immunoglobulin. Um, and I would use that a couple of times daily or colostrum. Um, and depending on my patient's goals there, really, if they, if they're a vegan, I probably would not use an immunoglobulin, nor would I use honey, but I would use some other form of superficial immune support. Um, and I'd keep it really simple. I would say, you know, drink a little bit of red wine daily or a couple of times a week, drink green tea daily. Um, I'd probably, I might give it a licorice tincture and I might not. Some people have a pretty strong aversion to the flavor of licorice, but I'd keep it really simple. The so black cumin seed and mastic gum, I would do that for two months. That would be the kind of the backbone of my treatment with broccoli sprouts. I think even in the world of cruciferous veg, um, it seemed like over and over about 70 grams of broccoli sprouts was, was the magic dose of broccoli sprouts. If people like that kind of sharp, spicy taste, but you can do a lot, um, medicinally with your food. So I'd be incorporating as much as they could. Yeah. Amazing. Such a great answer. Thank you. Very, very in depth. Uh, number two is how would treatment change if virulence factors are present on the laboratory results? Oh, so I've got the slide on that. And I would, you know, for something like the BABA, which is an adhesion factor, I would treat a bit more aggressively. That is one that is going to be a really sticky H. pylori that's hard to, um, you know, hard to get rid of. So I would be treating with adhesion inhibitor inhibitors. I would be treating just a little bit more aggressively. Any virulence factors, I personally would use antibiotics and I'd hit them hard and heavy and I'd want to see them treated until they're fully eradicated. But for our non-prescribers, you can still treat aggressively with botanicals. Um, and you don't have to call it aggressively, but you treat firmly or, you know, with, with intention. Um, but I, I do, I I'm in Canada. So people like to use antibiotics here. They're easy to get and they're cheap up here. So, um, I have no problem using well, well chosen antibiotics, but I would choose a regimen that actually works. So I wouldn't necessarily go for a triple therapy that has a low, um, low efficacy, low, um, eradication rate. I'd go for something with 90 plus percent. And I'd want to retest until it's gone. So I treat, wait a month, retest. If it's lower at that point, I may choose a natural protocol or add in more uh, virulence factor support. And again, that slide at kind of 
a third of the way through my presentation, we'll give you some guidelines of some botanicals that have research against those virulence factors. Thank you so much. And for those of the practitioners that are located in the United States, great news is, is that if you need to partner with uh, an additional provider to support your patient with antibiotics or other prescription, there's lots of options. And that co-management between providers is always very helpful. Uh, so, so great point there, Dr. Ralston. Thank you for that. Question, sorry, question number three is, is it true that H. pylori can coexist with candida? I know you discussed this a little bit, but can you discuss um, how that is true? And if so, how do you manage this? Yeah, so like I mentioned, the H. pylori can actually, it seeks out candida and it makes this, vac this vacuole around itself. So it lives and replicates inside candida, which is a really gross concept. They've done, um, you know, vaginal cultures of, of females and found H. pylori positive in about 50% of samples of vaginal yeast. So it's there in the upper GI, there's a lot of yeast. And so H. pylori can live in there. It can actually be horizontally transmitted from, you know, one yeast to its baby yeast cell. And so it can live in yeast for a good long time. Yeast will protect it against high acid conditions. And so when I see H. pylori on a test and I also see yeast, I'm going to treat the yeast at least, at least at the same time, if not before the H. pylori. Because if you treat your H. pylori that's outside the yeast, and then you treat the yeast and release a whole bunch of H. pylori, you're just adding more work to your plate and you're probably taking away from your patient's trust. So I would treat the yeast first um, and I'd wanna make it all go away because H. pylori is just one really sneaky organism and people really struggle with treating it. So just treat it once if you, if you can get away with it, but often it takes a couple of rounds. Makes sense. As you discussed, you could talk for hours and hours about this bug. So you did, again, a, just a fantastic job. So Dr. Alston, I have a couple more questions here for you today. You mm -hmm. talked a lot about natural supplements, about acid um, supplementation, but can you answer this question? Do you use hydrochloric acid or HCL supplementation with your natural protocols uh, as frequent as possible? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't use a PPI either. I mean, I... I, in mastic gum therapy, it has been shown that a little bit of HCL can be helpful. So if you wanted to, and you were just doing mastic gum, you could, but I do see that research that the mucosa is less viscous with a higher pH in the stomach. So I don't really modulate it in either direction, but if I treated an H. pylori, uh, an H. pylori case, I should say, and it came back still positive, I might include some acid suppression in the second round to see if we can get it a little bit more. And if I... I, you can't really tell when H. pylori moves into the coxoid form, but if I suspect that it has, so say somebody that you treat H. pylori, it goes away or goes to a low level, and then a year later it's back in full force, I'd be treating that with a lot more care around that coxoid form using more acid suppression, even with natural therapies. I'd have a lot of flax oil in that, in that treatment plan in NAC just to try to keep it happier, and I would be treating more aggressively. But um, in my general natural protocols, I I don't use HCL in my pro, in my probiotics, in my enzymes. So I avoid HCL use there, but I don't add in anything intentionally, at least in the first round of treatment for acid suppression. I'm going to qualify. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Dr. Ralston. I have one last question for you. It's a little bit of a, a all encompassing question, but if you can do your best is, uh, and to uh, distill it down as best as possible. And that is how would you manage H. pylori in pregnancy? I know you talked a little bit about this, but if you could uh, break this down a little bit for our listeners today. Yeah, so that's going to depend on the severity of the case. If somebody has hyperemesis gravidarum and they have high H. pylori, there are some antibiotic protocols that are safe in pregnancy and you could consider them. But what I would do first would be that cranberry and ginger. So ginger tea or ginger capsules. I use, you know, pretty heavy dosing of ginger capsules in nausea. And we do see that it can be anti-H pylori and the cranberry juice can be effective too. So I would see if that works. Um, and I would try to get away without treating it. Honestly, I would, I would work on management. I, you know, broccoli sprouts are safe in pregnancy. We're not worried about that. Um, so I would work on it with diet, red wine, not so much. Um, but we do all the other things that are pregnancy safe. And I would try to wait until after, after that person was done nursing to fully treat the H. pylori. Cause we just don't have good data during pregnancy and nursing. 
Makes sense. Completely understandable. Thank you again, Dr. Alston, for answering all those questions in depth. Just amazing responses. And I know we weren't able to get to everyone's question today, but please reach out to us after this live class if you still need help. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's live class. Huge, massive shout out to Dr. Amy Rolfson and Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. Just such a helpful presentation to understand H. pylori and all of its associations. And as Dr. Rolfson mentioned, you will have access to the presentation and the recording uh, after the live class. So again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you all at the next live class. Uh, Dr. Rolfson, again, thank you. So yeah, thank you for having me. Before you all leave, though, I have one, one last thing is that Adrian Martinez, who is our head of practitioner partnerships at RUPA, is going to be joining us for a live demonstration right now. So if you are new to RUPA, please stick around to learn more about how we can help you optimize your practice. And Dr. Mart uh, Adrian Martinez is now on our call here. Adrian, thank you so much for jumping on. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Anthony, and thank you so much, Dr. Rolfson, for that amazing presentation. Um, as Dr. Anthony just mentioned a moment ago, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships at Rupa Health. And really what that means is I spend my days speaking with practitioners to educate them regarding Rupa Health. Um, I speak at, at conferences. I'll do live classes like you're joining today. So I'm very excited to speak with you regarding Rupa and really who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Um, quick agenda of, of what we're going to run through uh, during this, this quick about 15-minute call is I want to show you exactly what Rupa Health is. Um, I'll show you exactly how we make it easier for you to place your orders, to track all your orders for lab results, as well as streamline and improve that patient experience, which can oftentimes you know, be uh, taking up a lot of time in your practice, right? So Let's start with the latter of what I mentioned a moment ago. Why do we do what we do here at Rupa Health? Well, we believe that making functional medicine the standard of healthcare is really what the future is. Personalized medicine and the ability to give these patients the answers uh, to their ongoing ailments, um, as opposed to just giving them a Band-Aid to treat everything, right? Uh, but unfortunately at this time, there are a lot of speed bumps, there's a lot of hurdles um, that are associated with these lab testing. You know, when you think about the general practitioner, you can be working with anywhere from three to six, if not more labs at any given time. What that means for you is you have an individual portal that you're interfacing with each time you wanna order from these different labs. So that alone can be a lot to manage where you're getting all your results from placing all your orders. Um, and that's not even discussing the patient experience. You know, when you think about the patient experience ordering from these labs, there can be a lot of pain points. You know, not only just the fact that a lot of these tests are cash pay, uh, which can make it a little bit difficult for just gaining entry and access to these tests, but also things like, um, how are you coordinating phlebotomies if you're not only just seeing patients in person, but let's say you're working in telehealth, right? Um, how are you providing FAQs and instructions, creating videos to walk your patients through these different tests, managing all of their different questions? Um, and that's, of course, on top of what I just mentioned ago, all the admin work that can be associated with that, right? So what we've done at Rupa Health is we've created a platform that's designed to alleviate a lot of the pain points that can oftentimes be associated with these tests, the ones that I just mentioned, right? So what we've done is we've brought on 20 plus different labs onto our platform. I'm gonna jump right into the catalog here. So you, as a practitioner, are able to order from 20 plus different labs in one place now without having to go to each individual portal to do so, right? We just heard from uh, Dr. Rolfson at Diagnostic Solutions. They're one of our amazing partners, right? So you can order from Diagnostic Solutions. You can order from SpectraCell, Dutch, any one of these tests all in one place. Um, over 2,000 different tests, over 20 plus different labs. The second and equally as important component to Rupa Health which can sometimes be overlooked is the patient experience. You know, when you think about it from a business perspective, that patient experience reflects directly upon your business. So the better and more fluid patient experience that we can provide, the better a result it's gonna have on your business, right? The better impact it will have. So as soon as you place an order from Rupa Health, we can effectively take it from there. We can manage billing for you. Um, or of course you have the option of paying for the tests yourself and billing the patient outside of Rupa. We offer multiple different payment options beyond cash and credit. We can do HSA, we can do FSA. We can even set up a three month interest-free payment plan. That's all with the idea 
of lowering that barrier of entry to these oftentimes very expensive tests, right? So that's one way that we go about that. From there, we'll send over our own curated FAQs and instructions to the patients. If they have any questions, they can reach out to us and our team and we will facilitate answering those questions for you so you and your team no longer have to. If there's a blood draw required, we will assist in coordinating a phlebotomy and a blood draw. So the list kind of goes on in terms of just us taking that heavy lifting off of your shoulders and onto ours, even managing specimen issues, right? From there, you're alerted as the results come in and you're able to view everything within Rupa Health all in one place. So I know I just talked a lot, but let's dive into it and see exactly what that looks like, right? So what you're seeing here is the main Rupa Health dashboard. The first thing I'll show is really how simple it is to place an order on our site. To create an order on Rupa, you just need three bits of information. The patient's first name, last name, and email address. We collect everything else directly from the patient. It makes things easier for you and your team to start and create an order. You're not gonna have to enter in all the patient information, address, phone number, so on and so forth. As well as ensures the accuracy of the information from that patient, right? Patient's information can change, they can move addresses, they can change phone numbers, so on and so forth, right? So we'll collect that information directly from the patient. What you're seeing now is the ordering screen. So the first set of tests you're seeing up here at the top, women's comprehensive, uh, metabolic comprehensive, these are bundles. So we can actually create custom bundles on Rupa Health, a bundle being a set of tests, a set of blood panels, a combo of blood panels and tests really from any one of our partner labs all in one. So that way it's just one single click and all the tests that you're looking to bundle up are added into your cart without having to search through an entire catalog of 2000 tests, right? And you can customize these to be whatever tests that you want them to be from. Below that, you have a favorites list. So a favorites list being a individual test that you're commonly ordering. You can put a little heart next to that favorites test. And that way, again, it'll be appearing at the very top of your order screen. So same idea here. You don't have to search through the entire catalog of 2000 tests to find the one you're looking for. It's right here at your fingertips. Below that, you have access to the entire catalog, of course. So if there is a specific test you're looking for that's outside of maybe a bundle or a favorites, um, then you have access to it down below and you can make searches, you can filter by company, even searching by test type. Let's say that you're looking for a blood spot as opposed to a full serum draw, right? And with that, once you're ready to place your order, it's as simple as clicking which test that you want to order, right? So let's say I want to order this GI map from Diagnostic Solutions and maybe a Mycotox as well. I'm able to order from as many different companies as I want at my fingertips within seconds. They're added into my cart over here on the right-hand side. And then from there, I actually have a couple of different options of customizing this order, right? So I actually have the option of scheduling it out. So let's say that I'm working with an existing patient and I wanna retest them six months down the line, I can automate this for you, right? So all we're gonna do is hop in here and schedule when we want that order to go out. So what we're doing is leveraging the technology that's come to be expected in 2021 to make life easier for us, right? Once those tests are added into your cart over here on the right-hand side, if there's an add-on test you're looking at, let's say that I wanna add Zonulin to my GI map, it's as simple as clicking the add-on tests available. That'll let you know, of course, that there is an add-on test available. It'll bring up the details of this test. It'll show you the sample type, the shipping and turnaround times that are to be expected. You can download a copy of the patient instructions. As I mentioned earlier, we will send a copy of the patient instructions directly to the patient, but let's say that you wanna save some for your own or even just get an idea of what they look like. We show you here. We'll show you an example of the sample report. And of course, if there's any biomarkers, we make those very transparent for you to be able to be seen here. From there, if you are looking to add that zonulin, it's as simple as clicking into that zonulin and it will be added onto your add-on. Speaking to pricing, we offer the lowest possible practitioner prices. So what that means is the same prices that you would get having an account with any one of our partner labs, those are the same prices you're going to see here at Rupa Health. So we're not upcharging, we're not changing those prices. We're offering the same prices that you would get going directly to the labs. Uh, the way that we generate our revenue is that there's a flat 7% processing and ordering fee on each order. Now, this is paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. So let's take a step back. To sign up for Rupa Health is free. You don't have to put a credit card down. There's no subscription fee. There's no monthly cost to it, anything. This 7% processing and ordering fee that you're seeing here, this is the way that we generate our revenue and the only way that we generate our revenue. Now, this is paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. What that means is that if you're having us invoice the patient directly, meaning the patient is the one paying for the tests directly, then they will be the one absorbing this cost, right? That $37.52. You as a practitioner in that instance, you don't pay anything. 
So Rupa Health can potentially be a free addition and a free platform to you, for you to use as a practitioner in your clinic for free. The only time you would ever pay for an order is if you decide to pay for an order, right? In that instance, you have the option here of paying for an order. Otherwise, it'll default to having us invoice the patient directly. We have the option of adding notes for the patient. Notes for the patient can be anything, you know, for example, if you have the patient taking a specific supplement regimen and you want to give them more exact instructions, you have that option here to, you know, communicate directly with the patient through Rupa. You can even create a snippet, which is essentially a saved template. So if you're consistently using the same instructions or sets of instructions, you can save those directly within Rupa Health and have that automated as a template so you don't have to retype the same instructions out every time. Notes for Rupa can be anything to us. And then ICD-10 codes. So you're able to add ICD-10 codes on, e on any order. Um, and what this would allow for is for your patients to submit a super bill for their insurance for reimbursement. We have a full catalog built into here. So you don't even need to know the exact ICD-10 code off the top of your head. You just need to know a keyword and we'll bring up our entire catalog there. But if it's nothing else, it's as simple as clicking send a patient. And that's how you create and send an order on Rupa Health in seconds from 20 plus different labs, from a catalog of over 2000 different tests. What I'm gonna show you next is how we're tracking all these orders. So within your main dashboard here is where you're tracking all your orders, okay? So here's this uh, draft that we just created. You can notice that I use Chris Burton for just about everyone. He's actually a good friend of mine, um, but you can see that we'll update the statuses of each order along the way. I can search by specific patient. I can even filter by status of my orders. If I'm working in a multi-practitioner practice or clinic, I can have multiple practitioners on this single account and be able to filter by practitioner to see which doctor is ordering what. But I'm able to click into any of my existing orders and see exactly where they stand. So for Tim Iverson, for example, I can click in, I can see that this is four tests from three different labs. And then I can get an idea, hey, I can see that the sample arrived on this date and I should expect these results during this time. That way I can plan accordingly. Once those results are in, you're able to click in, of course, you're getting notified and from there, you can download the results. You can send them directly to the patient. You can schedule a clinical consultation directly with the lab should you need some assistance interpreting the results. And of course, you have access to that digital requisition. One thing to note is we'll never send the results directly to the patient um, without your consent. You have full control over that. Additionally, the results that you're receiving are the same results that you would be receiving should you go be working directly with the lab. The idea here is you have all of your results, all your orders in one place, as opposed to having to go to multiple different portals to manage everything at once, right? And that's how you're able to track all your orders. With that, y'all, I'm gonna jump into what the patient experience looks like. So what we've seen so far is how to place an order on Rupa Health, how to track and manage those results once they come in, as well as those orders. But what does the patient see, right? As I mentioned earlier, the patient experience is extremely important. We wanna ensure that the patient is getting kind of that white glove service that's come to be expected in 2021. So how do we provide that? Well, as soon as you, you place that order on Rupa Health, your patient gets an email from us. Those communications will vary whether the patient's paying for the order themselves or you paid for the order already. The kits will be shipped out within 24 hours of payment. So one thing to really call out here is we differ from some of the labs in that we don't send the kits out until the payment is made, okay? We'll go ahead and send over FAQs and instructions to the patient for each of the orders, which I'll show you an example of in a moment. We'll follow up and check in with the patient. We automate this process. Uh, again, another way that we're leveraging technology to increase efficiencies for you and your business. What this has led to in really leveraging our platform is a compliance rate up above 85%. From there, you're notified as the results come in via email. So what does those communications look like? Well, this is an example of what it looks like should the patients be the one being invoiced for the order. Hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are and then we'll highlight the different payment options that we accept. So not only can we do HSA, we can do FSA uh, as well as cash, excuse me, we can do cash and credit, we can do HSA, we can do FSA as well as even setting up a three month interest free payment plan. I know I mentioned that previously. And then from there, we collect all the necessary information to complete the order shipping information, demographic information, and of course, billing information. And then from there, we'll highlight the uh, test that was ordered for them and any prices associated to those tests. So one thing again to call out here is the price of Rupa ordering on Rupa is the same whether you're paying or the patient's paying. There's gonna be no difference. The only differentiator there is going to be the 7% processing ordering the fee, which is how we generate our revenue, okay? If you decide to pay for the tests, the communications will look 
pretty similar, but with some key differences, of course, we're essentially just not gonna collect any billing information and we're not gonna highlight the cost of the test to the patient. So a reason why some practitioners or clinics might want to do this option is at this time, we don't provide you at Rupa the option to um, add an interpretation fee, for example. So if adding an interpretation fee is something that you wanna do and you really just wanna you know, add that in there and you wanna manage billing outside of Rupa, that would be an example of why you might do that in this billing option, okay? From there, we'll alert the patient once the tests have been shipped out. And then what this is showing you is an example of what the email will look like that we send out with the instructions for each test, with the instructions to fill out the requisition forms. And if there is a blood draw required, we will send over the options based off of the lab that they're working with um, to help coordinate that and facilitate that. If you are lucky enough to have a preferred phlebotomist or even have one in your office, you know we can take that information as well, customize the information and send that to the patient so they know where to go. Um, and if the patient, again, has any questions along the way, whether it's how do I take this test properly to, hey, I don't like these options that were sent over for the blood draws, we'll work with the patient and send over additional options as well as, of course, facilitate answering their questions for them. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of the Dutch Complete um, instructions that we'll send to the patients. So as you can see, very comprehensive, but also very user-friendly, right? Down to what to avoid dietarily before taking the tests. This is reiterating what I just mentioned a moment ago regarding walking through the phlebotomy experience as well as the requisitions. And then we'll follow up and, and uh, ensure that the patient has all their questions answered, right? So we'll continue to automate that follow-up. And then you're notified via email as the results come in. So you can see in this example, three different tests. We're alerting you as each individual test comes in. Um, so you don't have to wait for the entirety of each of the results to come in before viewing them. So. With that, those are the main components of Rupa Health. I'm gonna dive into some of these things on the side here in a moment, but just to kind of recap what we've covered so far, Rupa Health is a platform where you're getting 20 plus different labs in one place, the ability to order from 2000 different tests um, without having to go to each individual portal, view everything and all your results in our main dashboard. And of course, we will manage that entire patient experience for you. Where you're currently at is Rupa University. Rupa University, is a set of classes hosted by Dr. Anthony that you're currently attending. Um, we are consistently inviting doctors and um, essentially top influencers within the functional medicine landscape to come speak on any topic that's impacting and they feel is important within today's current medical landscape. So you can see, of course, you right now heard from Dr. Rolfson. Next week, we have Dr. Kalish coming on and giving an amazing talk with us. But any class in case you missed it or previously, you can hop on here and we will record and upload into our library so you have access to any class that we've ever done right within this. Of course, we have support. We have both practitioner as well as patient support. So if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to us through this messages portal or support at rupahealth.com and this will go directly to our team. Um, you can customize your settings. I know I showed you that you can customize things such as the notes to the patients, but we can go beyond that and create custom bundles. Um, team members, you can invite your team to join. So, you know, Rupa is not designed just for solo practitioners. We can work with clinic styles. So you're not too, too small or too large to work with us. We can make sure that we are accommodating and customizing our platform to work best for you. You simply are able to hop in here, invite a team member. They'll have their own login to hop into Rupa Health. Um, and like I mentioned previously, you can run filters to see which practitioner had made what orders. So things don't get confused. Last couple of things are the resources. We have a ton of resources available. So again, whether you're a newer practitioner or you've been around for a while, the help center is going to be massively beneficial. We have FAQs, um, we, you know, how to guide patients through the blood draws. We've even created our own bundle library within here. Um, and if you're a practitioner who does need a physician authorization in order to place orders, we have that coming out at the beginning of next year. So don't worry if you are a practitioner whose licenses or certifications may be limiting in your state. Hang tight, we're gonna get you covered very soon. Um, but with that, y'all, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. My name is Adrian Martinez. If you want to reach me, let me pull up my contact real quick as the Zoom bar is in the way. This will give you an idea of what my contact is. It's just adrian at rupahealth.com. You can reach me by phone as well, whatever is easiest for you. But with that, y'all, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be speaking with some of you uh, in the very near future and happy holiday season.